So good morning, students, colleagues. I would like firstly to take the opportunity to convey my appreciation to the Academy for Culture Diplomacy for the invitation to address this forum on democracy and peace. I also would like to thank you, Mark, for your tireless efforts in facilitating my, my participation. But before I speak further, I would like to take a moment to convey my deep respects to the peoples of Turkey and Syria. Also, I would like to convey my heartfelt condolences to the families from these countries who have lost their loved ones due to the catastrophic earthquake. It, in, it is indeed an honor to be participating during the discussion on the important subjects of peace and democracy. And I do commend the Academy on the team so aptly chosen for this World Year's Forum, namely Growing Threats for Democracy Around the World. Indeed, there are a never-increasing number of diverse threats for democracy to be sustained in today's uncertain world. And I would like to approach the subject from a different perspective than is probably usually discussed during such meetings. I will therefore be focusing my contribution on my belief that it is by investing in our children and young people that sustainable peace and effective democracy can be achieved and subsequently enjoyed. However, before I delve deeper into the subject, I would like to pose an overarching question to challenge our mindset, while I will also briefly share some of my thoughts with you. And my question is, are our politicians investing enough in empowering our children and young people in the essential skills and ethical values to become tomorrow's resilient leaders of our communities and societies. And this brings me to the research study by a group of political scientists that collect data on democracy. The project called Regimes of the World, which is based at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. This research highlights that while many more countries have become democracies over the, over the last 200 years, however, data for Europe shows otherwise. This research study is indicating that although democracy remains the main form of government in Europe, however, its performance is stagnant. It clearly shows that democracy in Europe needs a revival and re-energizing. It is evident to me that there is the urgent need for more investment in the empowerment of our children and young people, for them to appreciate and embrace the necessary skills and ethical values in building peace and subsequent effective democracy. Another research study by the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance further highlights that 17 democracies in Europe have suffered a shortfall in democracy in the last five years. This is truly worrying when one considers that Europe has been at the forefront of history to fight and stand up for democracy, human rights, and to build long-lasting peace. This research is showing, is showing us that practically 43% of the countries in Europe have this shortfall in democracy in the last five years. Europe has fought and is still fighting further wars to safeguard its democratic values, the values for res of respect for diversity, inclusion, equality, and equity that each and every one of us, whoever we are, from wherever we come from, truly deserve. Europe has fought 
and still fights to safeguard universal human rights and fundamental freedoms. Allow me to remind us all of the definition of democracy, as stated by the Universal Declaration on Democracy by the Interparliamentary Union, which is the global organization of national parliaments that aims to empower parliaments and parliamentarians to promote peace, democracy, and sustainable development. And the declaration says, and I quote, democracy is a universally recognized ideal which is based on common values shared by peoples throughout the world community, irrespective of their cultural, political, social, and economic differences. The very treaty of the European Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to all member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between women and men should prevail. Yet today, the world is going through unprecedented times where even the core values of democracy are being challenged. Many citizens are frustrated with the lack of action by democratic governments to address the most pressing challenges we are currently facing, such as rising inequality, lack of respect for human rights, and climate justice. And here, quite a number of pertinent questions come to my mind. What does democracy mean for the average person on the street? What does democracy mean for vulnerable and poor people? Would someone living in precarity and vulnerability be interested in safeguarding peace and democracy? I think not. Someone who lives in poverty, living with a feeling of disadvantaged and with a sense of being excluded, would not bother to think of democracy. Poor people would only think of the basic material things. They would think, for example, of the challenge of getting their next meal. Now, what about vulnerable children and young people? Would they embrace democratic values when they feel disadvantaged and excluded? I think not. We very well know that inequalities create socio-economic tensions, which most of the time result in conflict of some sort. And this is extremely worrying, especially when we know that one in four children in the European Union alone are in poverty. Not even the strongest of economies in the European Union can boast that child poverty is non-existent. What sort of peace are we building in Europe on which a functioning democracy must rest? Europe is one of the most affluent and wealthy regions of the world. However, my hope lies on the important initiative that the European Union has taken up in 2021, when the EU Council decided on the introduction of a child guarantee. Member States have committed to reduce poverty for five million children living in the European Union in the next five years. This is a silver lining in a gray cloud. I must admit that personally, it is not as much as I would have aspired. As the number of children living in poverty today totals nearly 20 million in the European Union. However, I must acknowledge that this is a historic step forward for the European Union to prioritize on child poverty. But now, what about the rest of the world? 1.2 billion children are living in poverty. What sort of peace are we building in the world, whereby more than half of the 2 billion of the global child population are poor? How can we build peace for, 
for sustainable democracies in a world afflicted with poverty, inequalities, vulnerability caused by wrong policies, lack of fair distribution of wealth, persecution, torture, conflicts, wars, natural disasters, and effects of climate change. How are we to address these inequalities and inequities? Has multilateralism failed us completely? Where is our world leadership in this? Are we as an international community truly investing in the safeguarding of our democratic values? Let me give you an insight into a recent report from Eurochild, of which I am president. Eurochild is a pan-European network of organizations that work with and for children. Through our member organizations being on the ground in 37 European countries, we are aware of the needs of all children across Europe in real time. The report is titled Invisible Children, Eurochild 2022 Report on Children in Need Across Europe. This most recent report is identifying differences and gaps within um, European member states which reg with regards to policies around children. And I'll mention a few. So some countries are perceiving children as their future workers and not as individual rights holders. Others are not including a child's rights perspective in their social policy and healthcare reforms. Some countries are not including children in policies where work-based migration policies prevail. Many countries are failing to focus on the mental health challenges of children. Others are not focusing on the development of new integrated services for children in the community. Some countries are not developing enough effective mechanisms and initiatives and programs for the inclusion of children at risk of dropping out of school or for effective support needed by the families, while most are not giving any particular attention to migrant children among the school dropouts and underachievers. Some are not focusing on child safety and protection in cyberspace and the digitalization of transition in general. Others are not including parenting support and the need to prioritize child poverty when targeting support for the most vulnerable households. Child participation processes are still very lacking in most countries and this violates Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Most countries are not consulting civil society organizations that work on the ground with and for children. Many are not focusing on children's environmental rights. Some are completely ignoring child poverty. Others do not have a policy on early childhood de development. Social housing for vulnerable families is identified as an urgent challenge in some countries. Proper planning is missing where children are concerned in most countries, manifesting itself also in the shortage of specific skills and professional preparedness in child and youth services. This general overview of the situation of children across Europe does not bode well to sustainable peace and effective democracy that we all aspire for. This reflects a huge democratic deficit, which, if not addressed, its effect will perpetuate itself into an intergenerational situation and would have a domino effect in the long run. In fact, in the book Democracy in Europe by Vivian A. Schmidt, she argues that the democratic, democratic deficit in the European Union is indeed a problem, but sees it more as a problem at a national level. She states that European governance practices are often in conflict with traditional ideas of democracy and the democratic 
nation state. Democratic stagnation, the pandemic, the Ukrainian war, the, the disruption of the supply chain, and the cost of living crisis have reignited a much needed debate in Europe on the underpinnings of the social contract and its future. In my opinion, this situation creates a window of opportunity not to be missed. If explored fully, it could address the diverse socioeconomic democratic deficit related to children and young people. I must also mention another huge challenge which we need, which we need to take into consideration. The last decade brought a surge in events that shook European dem democracy to the core. Europe, Europe experienced and is still experiencing the rise of populist movements with anti-European sentiments, fueling disintegration and growing grassroots protests over a number of issues, ranging from racism to socio-economic disparity. Unfortunately, populist movements are pushing stagnant traditional perceptions, which create a barrier to equality, equity, human rights, and civil liberties. Populist politicians have taken power in recent years in a number of countries in Europe, and right-wing populist movements have gained momentum. Principal investigator Jan Kubrick from Rutgers University says that the rise of populism can be attributed to a combination of social and economic factors. And I quote, the universal factor is related to dramatic changes in culture, society, and politics, and the move away from traditional ways of understanding sexual roles and family models. It must be noted that the rise in populism often leads to increased persecution of women, migrants, and LGBT citizens, and legitimizes violence against people who are different. Populism is a direct threat to peace and democracy. It erodes universal fundamental rights and freedoms. However, contemporary challenges to democracy in Europe go beyond the rise of populism. We need to acknowledge a multi multiplicity of threats to democracy, in particular, those arising from the structure of European economies and economic policymaking. Consequently, we have to acknowledge a sharp increase in economic inequality, ranging from income inequality to discrepancies in wealth and economic security, which over the past decades has translated into political inequality. In the economic basis of democracy in Europe, Bergson et al. suggests that in many countries, policymaking has been more responsive to the rich and is strongly biased in favor of the political demands and preferences of the affluent. When less, when less well, when the less wealthy in the European democracies support a policy opposed by those at the other end of the income distribution, or vice versa, the lower income group almost always loses out." Unquote. Another challenge is the migration phenomena. The flight of refugees is evidence of the essential need for each and every one of us to work for peace to build peace, to cultivate a culture of positive peace in our societies. We need to urge governments and leaders to actively engage in the right and appropriate actions and policies to sustain a peaceful coexistence among nations. We need to remind world governments and world authorities that they have committed to the, to the United Nations Agenda 2030, whereby SDG 16 specifically calls upon 
upon governments to promote peaceful and inclusive societies. We need to request world governments and world authorities to step up to their responsibilities to adhere to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and afford all of the rights to all the peoples without prejudice. We need to remind world authorities that they are the guardians of this important legacy by our foremothers and forefathers to present and future generations. Yet, we also need to remind ourselves that peace starts within each and every one of us. Let's not forget that each and every one of us has a responsibility to build and sustain a culture of positive peace in our communities. This means that we need to celebrate our diversity. We need to manifest the beauty of being different. We need to empower each other with respecting one another. And as Martin Luther King said, and I quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Even the smallest of our actions and attitudes can make a difference. Respect even in times of difference and adversity is the basis of a peaceful and harmonious coexistence. This is everybody's responsibility. We need to remind politicians that they need to do more to prevent and resolve conflicts and wars. We need to remind them to speak out and fight injustice instead of fueling the division. And as Albert Einstein said, and I quote, peace cannot be kept by force. It cannot, it can only be achieved by understanding. Another challenge in our face is the war in Ukraine, which has disrupted European politics, sending millions of Ukrainian refugees and half of the Ukrainian child population fleeing into neighboring European countries, while all Ukrainian children will need to be supported to overcome the traumatic effects of war. This is another huge challenge, as once again Europe has been thrown in the throes of war. It made European states focus on armaments rather than disarmament to the potential detriment of funds that could be afforded to social investment. The war in Ukraine has shaken Europe and sparked an unprecedented crisis that threatens the peace and stability that was taken for granted for so long. High inflation, economic distress and stagnation, the rise of far-right movements and energy supply concerns imperil the continent's democracy even further. As a woman from the Mediterranean, we have for the last decades seen the direct effects of wars and conflict on the migrants that come to our shores. We have experienced and still experience traumatized unaccompanied asylum-seeking children earnestly looking for refuge on European soils. However, even though we are aware of the effects of war, conflicts, persecution, torture, and climate change on children and young people in other parts of the world and are fleeing from these atrocities, many are being left by our authorities on the high seas in the Mediterranean or pushed back to horrendous environments. How will we convince these children and young people that Europe stands out and up for peace and democracy? How will we build peace to secure sustainable democracies with children and young people that suffer the effects of wars, conflict and persecution raging all around us and then treat them as second-class human beings? How can we empower our children to overcome the trauma of wars and conflicts and aspire again to live to materialize their aspirations of living in dignity and in peaceful coexistence. I think that firstly we need a harmonized global 
and European child protection system to ensure that no child is put to war and that every child is supported to overcome the effects, effects of war. I also think that we must ensure that no child should go without education and secure an education built on ethical values of respect, dialogue, caring and friendship. I believe that our education systems should be around peace education besides the achievement of academic and vocational training and qualifications. And here I quote Ms. Virginia Gamba, Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict, who stated, education is an ab absolute necessity, not just for the children themselves, but also for global peace stability and prosperity for all. Schools should be treated as sanctuaries and that is and that that is our common responsibility to ensure that every child has access to an education, even at times of conflict. In view of this I call on the international community to affirm the need to ensure that schools, even in war zones and areas of conflict, are endorsed as a safe space for children, commit to the avoidance of explosive weapons in schools and surrounding areas, and hold perpetrators of violations to account for grave violations of children's human rights. I also believe that, we, that if we empower our societies to acknowledge and uphold children's human rights and our governments commit to putting children at the heart of their political agenda and policies, we can be successful in addressing the scourge of division, peak inequality and inequity. Although this is at all order, however, if multilateralism functions and true political will prevails, we can then be sure that the next generation of leaders will be resilient enough to overcome the challenges that threaten our peace and our democracies. I will end with a quote by Albert Camus, who said, and I quote, democracy is not the law of the majority, but the protection of the minority. Children are a minority. Children are also vulnerable. However, with investing now in our children, we can be assured that they can be the game changers that we need to build peace for sustainable democracies. Thank you. I thank Mrs. Breker for having made us aware that democracy makes no sense in the absence of uh, social justice, in the absence of peace, and um, <clears throat> most generally, of course, if, it, uh, if you would uh, just wait for a while, please, okay, so because we have uh, a few more minutes for discussion, for questions and answers uh, to Mrs. Breka. And uh, it was particularly important that you made us aware of this uh, philosophical insight of Albert Camus, that the essence of democracy is uh, related to the rights. It's not just a mechanical uh, system where 51% uh, uh, rule dictatorially over 49. Majority decisions are only legitimate as long as they do not contradict the basic rights of every individual. Uh, please, if uh, there is any uh, question from the floor, if I may, uh, may I just check you? Uh, if not for the moment, one, uh, if you allow me, yes. uh, just to address one point which you uh, explained, to, which you spoke about initially. Namely, you referred to the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, and its definition of uh, democracy. Uh, should one not I mean, I'm not aware of the details, but should one not pay a special attention, even a parliamentary body, to the fact that uh, the system of representation, as we practice it all over in the Western world, can also 
be, um, so to speak, backed up by other mechanisms of decision making, namely by form of referendum. Switzerland has a long experience and practice in this kind of hybrid system of direct participatory democracy and representative democracy. And the advantage of such a system is that if need be, on concerning very difficult and controversial issues, it may ultimately be the electorate in general that will make a decision that has uh, the power of a uh, constitutional norm. That is how it has been practiced in Switzerland. And should one not also pay attention to that yeah. in, uh, here in, in our European environment? And just the second question uh, uh, concerning uh, what you spoke about children and social justice. The, uh, problem faced now by so many people, so many families in Europe is that they are not able with the family income, maybe of just around 2,000 euro quite often, that's how it is in Austria. They are not able uh, to cover the expenses for heating, for energy, it's because heat. prices exploded by 300% or even depending on this uh, provider by 400%. Those who decided to sanction uh, all these uh, energy um, uh, contracts, or to stop all of these contracts, they will not suffer because if I'm, if one lives uh, on on a salary that is 20 times higher than the average salary, it makes no not much difference if the heating is three times more expensive. But there are thousands of families, even in Austria, who now do not know how to uh, cover the expenses, and that also severely affects the situation of children if, of for course. a family with uh, several children. And um, should politics not pay attention also to that and not just make uh, grand uh, decisions of geopolitics without paying attention to what this means for the people who effectively are those who are supposed to rule? These are, would be the questions. Thank you, Professor. This, these uh, two questions are, I think, cover, uh, cover a lot. Um, let me take you the first question, uh, where you have mentioned, uh, one could say, the direct representation, another, um, how can I say, form of democracy. But also, there are, and I agree with you, I mean, we, we have an array of, of, uh, of forms, if we like, uh, for example, I would see also civil society organizations as another pillar of democratic way of doing things. Civil society do represent on the ground many a time the aspirations of citizens, of, of groups, of communities, and therefore consultation with them is very, very important. These processes of uh, governments creating processes of participation, of consultation, is very important. I would say also the media, which is the fourth pillar, one could say, or the fourth estate of, 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 uh, of democracy, is also very important to be part of the equation of how we um, practice, implement democratic life. So I think there is an array of, of, of possibilities how we can strengthen our democratic way of doing things. And again, I will bring children into the equation. Yes, child participation is a child human, human rights. It emanates from the UN, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We are obliged to listen to children and not just listen, but also take into consideration and act. And I, I say children's human rights because the UNCRC is um, attached to the, United, the, to, to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, so this is also the UNCRC is the mo wa most widely um, um, ratified convention that the United Nations have ever, have ever had. Um, all countries except just one have signed to that and ratified. So yes, there are many levels of how we can um, and ad, ad, an array of uh, ways of how we can um, strengthen our democracy. Direct democracy, as the Swiss 
um, uh, conducted is a good way, but again, it for maybe for some countries would not be so, uh, how can I say, attractive due to the continuous way of, 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 of uh, calling, referendum, etc. Now, as for the issue, the crisis issue, the, the, the energy crisis issue in, 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 in uh, Europe, and I would say um, uh, it's, it's hitting quite a number of other countries, not just particularly, particularly the, the European um, continent. Yes, I do believe that in everything, and that's why I emphasized that we need to have commitment from our governments to put children, all vis children um, at the, uh, at, 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 uh, on the political agenda. Many a time we speak of everybody, but children are always left out of the equation, even when we speak of family. If we don't give visibility to children, we lose them. And many, for many, for many uh, children are the future. No, children are now. Children are now. But ch children will be the future leaders um, of our countries, so communities, and societies. But we need to, to, to really put them at the heart of our policies, even when we have disputes, even when we have conflicts. We cannot possibly go into things by looking, um, or rather analyzing things from a desk or, or from around the table. And that's why child participation is very important. Children, I, I, I uh, participate in a lot of such processes and engage in conversation with children right across Europe. And the mom, I am so overwhelmed every time with the way children look at things, with the way even the youngest of children, even children from the early years. It's, it's incredible. And I, wherever I go, I try to suggest to uh, recommend to politicians to really sit down with children and hear them speak, and they would get the best electoral manifesto for any election that they will, that they will stand for. So if, if we, we really have, and again, this all boils down to our democratic ways of doing things, if we also um, create the safe spaces for children and create this um, participation processes, then when we come to discussing, negotiating, or um, also sanctioning, we can have all this mapped out in front of us. And even our sanctions will be, uh, will, will be taken, taking into consideration the many implications. The many implications that, yes, now everybody is um, suffering and, mo and always it's the most vulnerable that suffer most. Because as you have aptly said, undoubtedly, People who are comfortable, when you, take, when you take just a little from them, they will still have quite a lot. But people who are poor, as soon as you take just a little, you put them off the, um, off the radar completely to have a dignified and uh, the right level, um, and the right standard of living. Thank you again. Thank you. Mrs. Brecker, it was uh, a very comprehensive uh, overview of uh, the major challenges in terms of social justice and peace democracy is facing today. Thank you for sharing your insights with us. Thank and you. Your Thank you, Professor. Thank you.